On today's EMN5, we're going to talk about foreign body injections. And this usually occurs between six months to about three years old. The good news is most of these pass spontaneously without much complications. Only about 10 to 20 percent need endoscopic removal and only one percent need surgery. So you have a patient who comes in, mom says she was playing with a coin, then she can't find the coin, I think maybe she ate it. So the three things I want you to first think about, look at your ABCs, determine if the patient is high risk, and now we need to find the coin. So you walk into the room and the patient's having some strider and respiratory distress. That's concerning that the object's in fact in the airway and not in the digestive tract. What if they're gagging? Maybe in the hypopharynx? What if they have some drooling and vomiting? Yeah, we're thinking maybe about esophageal obstruction or a lot of edema from a prolonged ingestion. What about swelling and pain or crepitus? Yeah, that's concerning for perforation or a lot of edema. So make sure you assess your ABCs. Next, is this patient high risk? We're gonna split this into high risk objects and high risk patients. So what are our high risk objects? Basically anything that's sharp, that's obvious, that can cause perforation. Long objects, those can cause perforation or just not pass spontaneously. And then we have our disc batteries or button batteries and magnets. So let's talk about these button batteries. These are concerning because the pressure of the esophagus on both sides of the button battery and a wet surface create a current. This can cause tissue necrosis, perforation, leaking of the battery, lots of bad stuff. And in just two hours, it can cause some esophageal injury and four hours of full thickness injury. That's scary. Now what if parents say, oh, well, the battery was dead, doesn't matter. These can cause injury to just that little bit of current that's left. What about our standard flashlight batteries? These are actually okay. We haven't seen too many complications with these. Now what about magnets? It's not just one magnet that's a problem, it's when the patient swallows more than one magnet. And these buckyball toys have been in the news recently for causing a lot of complications. Basically they get in different parts of the intestinal tract and the magnet causes tissue necrosis, perforation, obstruction, lots of problems, which is why these toys have now been banned from the market. Now who's a high risk patient? Prolonged ingestions and also people that are going to be at risk for not passing the object spontaneously. So ask the parents, does the patient have a history of pyloric stenosis when they were a kid, previous ingestions, especially in kids with developmental delay that could cause strictures or scarring, history of surgeries or any congenital abnormalities. Now we need to figure out where is this object located. And to do that, we're going to do a PA and lateral chest x-ray. And this is a little algorithm that helps us determine where the object is and what our disposition is going to be. Specifically, we need to see, is the object in the esophagus or did it pass into the stomach or intestine? Let's look at a couple x-rays. If it's in the esophagus, it'll tend to either be in the upper, the mid, or the lower. And if you find it elsewhere, it might be concerning for a pathologic stricture. Now here's a little boards question. Is this coin in the esophagus or the tracheal? Good, this is in the esophagus. Esophageal coins tend to be flat on a PA film. And here's an example of a tracheal coin, which is very rare. And you can see here that it's side of the coin. Now, is this a coin that we're looking at? No, this is a button battery. And remember, those are pretty concerning and they can look a lot like coins. So things to look for, if you're seeing them um, on the flat side here, they should have that double ring sign. And the coins are nice and flat if you look at them laterally, whereas button batteries tend to have this extra ridge. Now what if we don't see it in the esophagus or the intestine? It could be that the patient either hasn't eaten it or has already passed it. So we need to ask, are they symptomatic or high risk? If they are, we need to get a CAT scan and we need to find that object. So let's say we find the object in the esophagus. We need to call GI because these are high risk for perforating, causing edema, tissue damage, and they probably need to do an endoscopy to get it out. In certain populations, we can do a watch and wait and see if it passes. These are gonna be patients with an object in the lower esophagus, a recent ingestion, or patients that are a little bit older. Now, if we find that the patient has passed the object beyond the esophagus, but they have symptoms or they're high risk, we need to call GI or surgery. Otherwise, if they're asymptomatic and the object is blunt and not concerning, we can actually send these patients home. Tell mom to look for the object passing in the stools and for any signs or symptoms that there's complications such as belly pain, blood in the stools, vomiting, fevers, and maybe have them follow up with their primary in a day or two to get a repeat x-ray. Here's one last x-ray. These are adult patients, females, and we have find these long objects. This is really strange, right? A spoon and here's a toothbrush. We need to watch out for bulimia on these patients. They use the objects to induce retching and can end up swallowing them by accident. So for three to remember for foreign body injections, number one, figure out if the object or the patient is high risk. We need to figure out where it is if it's stuck in the esophagus. We need to call GI if it's passed into the stomach or the intestines and they're asymptomatic and they're low risk. Then you can send the patient home with education and follow-up. Thanks for joining us on EMN5.